Hello, my name's Andy Turrell, and I'm going to be giving the next three lectures um, on the bio-inspired computation model module. Uh, Steve, Steve Smith's already given you a lot of um, information and background in detail on, on software um, within computational intelligence systems and bio-inspired systems. Um, and the next three lectures that I'm going to talk about are really focused more on hardware. So they're looking at hardware systems and how we might apply computational intelligent methods um, to such systems. And of course, being in an electronic engineering department, uh, I'm going to focus very much on, on applying evolutionary techniques to, to electronic hardware. Although if you, if you do a bit of a search, um, you'll find that, that um, evolutionary computation has, has been applied to many types of hardware, not just um, electronic hardware. So in this, in this first lecture, um, I'm going to be talking a bit about an introduction to evolvable hardware and then focusing somewhat on, on digital hardware. Um, given we're, we're doing this online, um, what I've done is each lecture would be divided into three parts, which I'll refer to not unexpectedly as parts one, two and three. And each of those will be around 15 or 20 minutes. So it'll, it'll be a, a relatively short um, video and it gives you a time to break in between. Or although, of course, you could, if you want to do, just watch each one, one straight after the other. OK, so without further ado, let's let's move, 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 move on. So what is evolvable hardware? Well, the, the, it's kind of on the what it says on the tin. Um, it, it's looking at using evolutionary techniques, so computational intelligent techniques applied to various hardware systems. So it, it, it's a mixture of a number of topics, really, and a number of, of things that some of many of which you've actually come across already. So one is looking at artificial intelligence or computational intelligence, bio-inspired algorithms, um, and applying those to some sort of hardware which can change, which we can reconfigure, reconfigurable hardware. And so one obvious example of that, which which you'll all be aware of, um, and which we'll talk into some detail in 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 part. Um, part two of, of this lecture is, is is FPGAs, so hardware which we can reconfigure with with using software, and by using those two things combined, reconfigurable hardware and, and computational intelligence, we can actually automate design. So we we rather than doing everything if you like by hand, we might be able to use computational intelligence to to automate design. We can produce autonomous systems. So systems that make decisions on their own and reconfigure or adapt as, as time goes on. And all of those things combined that allow us to do reconfigurable with overall hardware, which is kind of the uh, an overlying title of these series of, of three lectures. OK, so let's move on. What, what is evolvable hardware? Sorry, why do we want to use evolvable hardware? Well, it, it allows us to develop flexible and survivable systems. Systems that are capable of doing things without human intervention autonomously. So obvious examples are, are, are to reconfigure themselves, so self-configuration, self, um, to tune parameters to maybe make themselves better over time, and, and self-repair, so when, when things go wrong. So we, we can, adapt, we can adapt, adaptively change um, through reconfiguration, through e e evolutionary techniques, computational techniques, um, appropriately um, for signal processing, for sensing, for control, um, and, and a, a kind of an obvious example, which which most of us I think can can imagine, is this idea of of a fault coming and allowing a system to survive by changing itself um, autonomously. And if hardware has been proven in uh, in, in in autonomous design successfully in, in calibrating systems, so physical systems, where maybe the model um, that you're simulating the original system with, when you put it on actually the hardware, there are differences between the simulation and the hardware. And so we could use evolution to fine tune and, and calibrate the system. Um, and we can have in-field adaptation of, of the hardware to do with things like sensing and control, and indeed robotics. And we'll see in, in the third lecture, uh, of this three lecture series, um, uh, the application to robotics. There's a couple of examples in this in, in, in lecture one as well. 
And then finally, we can actually use evolution to, for design. So from scratch, if you like, from a random um, um, starting point to actually produce original designs. And we'll see some examples of those now. Um, so let me, let me give you a, a very brief example of, 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 um, of one example of, of, of evolvable hardware. So this, this is a, a chip um, that, that was designed at York. In fact, it's called the Panda chip. And we will look at this in, in, in lecture three of, of, um, of, of this series. And so th th this chip has a, a, a series of, 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 of blocks, if you like, they're all similar. It, it, it's similar to an FPGA, but we'll see later on, it's not quite an FPGA. So it's, it's similar to an FPGA. So it's made up of, of a series of, of identical blocks, of identical cells within the system. And if you run a, a, a small program on each of those cells, which says, okay, what's the maximum frequency that I can go at in, in this series of cells? What these colors suggest is the frequency or they represent the, fre the maximum frequency of these cells. And so the different colors suggest that each cell is slightly different, has got a different frequency. And this is just because of the, the, the fabrication variability of chips these days, because of the small feature size of these devices. And of course, what you might want to do is, is you might want to try and bring the frequency differences smaller and smaller for a particular application. So you're not getting variation in your, in your design. So one way of doing that, it, it would, would be to actually, if you could change the parameters within this device, in fact, in the, and in this chip you can, you could use evolution to narrow the, 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 the difference in the frequencies. So what this graph on the right shows is that this is frequency up here. This is the number of, if you like, the number of generations in your evolutionary loop. And what this shows is that, is that by varying certain parameters of this chip, the difference in frequencies across the chip can be reduced to, to a much smaller value than we started off with by simply by using an evolutionary loop to do that. So that's an example of, of having evolution running on some hardware. Okay, so let, let, let's go back to some more fundamentals and, and, and how we might categorize evolutionary hardware, evolvable hardware. So, so we've got a graph here which shows for, so if you think about electronic systems, we might divide them up into digital and analog. And then how else might, might we divide these things up? Well, we could evolve the, the either digital or analog off chip, so using a simulator, so using something like SPICE or VHDL, or we could actually do the evolution on chip, so actually on the physical hardware, if, if that allows us to do that. So in, in, in evolutionary parlance, um, on chip is called extrinsic evolution, and on chip is called intrinsic evolution. So if we look at the history of, of evolvable hardware and where we are today, what we find is that most evolvable hardware has been done off chip in the digital domain, in this quadrant here. But work has been done in all four of those domains and, and we'll see examples of, of each of those over, over the three lectures that we're, we're gonna consider in this course. Okay, so why, why, why do we need them? Why do we need evolvable hardware? Well, one example is autonomous systems. So the picture on the left here shows a NASA autonomous aircraft, and the picture on the right shows a rather cool robot. Um, it's from one of the best science fiction films um, ever made, and I'll, I'll leave you to investigate if, you, if you're interested about where this robot might come from. But what, why do we need autonomous systems? Well, one of them might be actually, we, we, the, the systems we're producing, are, uh, we, we're gonna uh, deploy them in, in, in areas where it's physically difficult to reach and to repair them, or maybe beyond communication. So you could think long distance um, space flight, you could think maybe underwater um, or, or in regions where communications can't get to, where there's high radiation and things like that. So where we want to increase the, the, the degree of autonomy, where, where, where systems, we don't want to be communicating with them, telling them what to do all the time, that they make their own decisions. Unmanned vehicles is another good example which, where we're talking about autonomous systems. Deploying sensor systems where you want them to reconfigure themselves 
um, given in, in, in a particular area or location. Space systems I've already mentioned. And finally, places where humans can't do um, effectively or economically or safely um, interactions with such systems. So that there are actually lots of, uh, lots of applications where autonomous systems are useful. And to get autonomous systems, um, evolution is, is applied quite often to those sorts of systems. Okay, so here's a, here's a simulation example, although you'll see there's some hardware in the minute, of self-repair. So we've got a structure here of robots and a failure is identified in the middle here. So this system identifies autonomously which one is the failure. The robots next to it stay connected, the others disentangle. These robots then can drive the, the failed robot away. These robots then decide we want to reconfigure back to the same structure, which is the structure that's closest to the one we had. So in this case, this one has still got seven components which are right, these others are smaller. So this signals the others to say, okay, well, actually I'm gonna stay as I am. The rest of you can actually disentangle your structures and become spare robots so we can recreate the organism that we first thought of, if you like, that we were first configured. So you'll see now that, that this one now becomes a, a, an organism which says, okay, I'm now recruiting new robots to produce this structure. All of the other robots in the system then become available to this structure to start configuring again. And then what you'll see is this one signals these robots to say, okay, I'm looking for somebody to fill this spot, please. And when that's happened, this one signals, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a, a, a quite an old project now of robots that we were involved with where it, it's, it's now trying to run that, that, that software um, on real robots. I, I promise you that one's not being pulled away, but just getting the cable out of the way. But this one is seen as faulty. This one moves out of the way. Because we don't have many robots, we have to imagine that a series of, of other robots will pull the faulty robot away. Once we've done that, this one says, okay, I've still got two robots in the right position. These have only got one. So this one now starts reassembling back to the structure. If we now assume that this is a, a robot that's no longer faulty, either it's repaired itself or um, it's a new robot. Okay, when you've only got four robots, it's quite difficult to, to do large um, <coughs> real experiments. And what you'll see is this robot finally um, re-engages with this structure and then this robot on the far left here will move in um, as you will see with a, with a, a small amount of help from its friend and um, from a friend to, to come back to the original structure. That takes a little bit of time, it's got a rather strange movement of its wheels to get there. This is, as I say, with a, with a small helping hand and we get the structure back in. So that, that, that it was a hardware um, replication of, of, of some of the software that I just showed you in that using self reconfiguration. Um, what we are doing at York now is we're coming up with a new system um, which is using a new type of robot being designed at York. So these are simulations of different structures um, with a kind of a master and slaves structure type thing, thing here. One of the interesting things that when you perform these sort of modular robot structures is actually the movement of the whole structure is actually quite difficult to, to coordinate. So you need, you need an idea of, if you like, a clock size to say, okay, I'm going at three o'clock or five o'clock or six o'clock so to move all the robot. So these two, so simulations of the system, and here we're actually showing snapshots of, of the real robots that have been, as I said, which have been designed here, configuring together. Just to give you a bit of a bigger picture, this is what these look like. So these are probably 30, 35 centimeters that way. So a foot and a bit in, in each direction um, to, to show how these move. So that's a, a current project going on at York. Okay, so why might we want hardware to adapt in, in, in the system? Well, there are, there, are, there are many examples why that might be. So one is the environment changes. So if something happens in the environment, maybe it gets much hotter, much colder, we need the, the, the electronics to, to adapt. 
in those sorts of environments. There must be maybe a mismatch in fabrication. So I mentioned earlier when we were showing the, the chip design that these days with the, the size of fabrication that, that we actually get mismatches, we get variation across chips. So can we in real time actually adapt the hardware to, to get over those mismatches in fabrication? We might get things failing. We might get faults in our system. We might want new functionality. And remember, if we can't get to it, or it's not easy to get to, then maybe we want it to evolve the new functionality itself. Or we might get new users who want a different kind of interface, a different functionality of the system. So there are many reasons why we might actually want hardware to adapt um, in, 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 in real time. Okay, so what are the components that we need, that we might need um, to allow us to, 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 to have evolvable hardware systems? So the, the, the first set is the hardware. And so we actually need hardware that we can change. So most of the stuff we will look at is, is electronics, actually it's focused on electronics, but some work has been done on, on in the past on designing antennas. Um, so many of you I'm sure will have, have in probably in the second year, will have looked at antenna design, um, but actually some work has been done on automatic design of antennas um, using evolutionary techniques. And also MEMS and BioMEMS, Devices might, may, may be things that change. But as I said, a lot of the stuff we will look at is, is going to be electronics, um, hardware, um, digital, analog, and, and some applied to robotics as well, in fact. So, but we need some hardware that we can change. We then need some mechanisms that, that have got some intelligence in them, which tells the hardware how to change. So this is a lot of the work so far you've been doing with Steve, looking at different evolutionary algorithms. Um, so it's kind of search and optimization algorithms and maybe using knowledge um, to, to help increase that, that um, uh, evolutionary system. And then bringing those two things together, um, we, we've got evolvable hardware. And we'll see later on that this could be some proprietary hardware, that's some stuff we can buy off the shelf, um, or indeed a lot of people have actually designed specific hardware to allow evolvable hardware systems to, to work. So we'll see examples of both of those. In, in later lectures. Okay, and, and the intelligence part of these mechanisms are uh, built in, um, allow us to, to control the, the adaptation and the self configuration I say allow us, but of course what we want it to do is actually to do this autonomously. Okay, so this is the end of the first part of, of, of lecture one. What we've got here are, are, are three papers which, which um, uh, are some of the old foundations, if you like, of, of evolvable hardware. If, if you have time either now before you watch part two or um, offline, if you like, av after the series, if you, if you want to look at these, I would recommend having a quick read. They're all really nice papers um, and give you some more background into the world of evolvable hardware. And just to finish off, um, a couple of questions which, which feed into the next part of, of this lecture. So, so how do you think, you know, give, given we're going to do some, something on, on digital devices, um, what, what sort of ones might be available and best usable for, for creating evolvable hardware systems? Um, and where might they be useful? So what sort of applications do you think they might be useful in? All right, so that's the end of, of part one of, of lecture one. Um, we'll be, we'll be moving, moving on to 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 further lectures um, and, and further parts of this in the near future. So for, for now, um, thanks for listening, and um, and 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 we'll be we'll 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 be back more later. Okay, thanks. <laughs>